Once again, a quick recap of what we have discussed and students, we have started with the discussion of Silk Road. And as I told you, it is an ancient, what? Trade route, a very strategically, you know, yes, uh, important route it was, a trade between the various countries and how, uh, you know, like the narrator, he wants to replicate that journey, he wants to replicate that route. And although he would not be able to, you know, visualize what things were so many, many years ago, but yes, he could imagine that what the problems the traders must have felt and what all they suffered as they had to go through that route. And on the route, as he has gone from India to Tibet and China, you know, like he's going there and he will be going through the, the water, the area of Kailash and Mansurovar. So here in this part or in this extract, what he's going to discuss, it is his journey over there. It is a pilgrimage that he undertook. And how, uh, as we had discussed that Lake Mansarovar, it is important for many religions. So whether it is for Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, right? So the Chinese, they have their own, uh, you know, like uh, religious significance for it. And uh, before I continue, let me see if I'm able to show you the video. Or I'll just uh, pause uh, and uh, then I'll show you maybe because of uh, copyrights and things like that. So as uh, we have uh, seen here, yes, uh, that is about the Parikrama of uh, Mount Kailash and Lake Mansarovar. Very, you can say, significant uh, religious place and uh, people there going for the Kora, right? Kora is the Parikrama. And uh, what have we noticed here? Yes, that uh, the terrain, how uh, inhospitable it is, how much difficult it is to go through that and people who are walking on foot uh, and uh, you know yes naturally it must be such a, a lot of problems they must be facing here also in this chapter we are going to talk about yes the personal experience the narrator is going to tell about the people he came across and uh, about the health issues that he had he talks about like while driving problems you have because uh, yes in the hilly areas it is quite unexpected. There might be snow, there might be landslide, there'll be, you know, a flock of sheep coming in the way. So many things happening, isn't it? So, right. And yes, you are at a high altitude. Your health is going to suffer, breathing issues you get, your breathing problems. So what all, you know, he experienced, this is what he is going to share. So what we had discussed yesterday was that he has started on now for the final leg of his journey. And he's going to start for that and he's leaving his post and uh, when he tells her that he's going to go to Mount Kailash and Lake Mansarovar and might perform the Kora so she gives him a very thick sheepskin coat that because it is quite cold and you might need it right so he's not able to understand but he has a person with him and there's a driver and there's an assistant here a guide who's able to translate and that is how he is able to communicate with the locals right so he's uh, gone over there and guess what has been described that what animals did he see he saw a gazelle like deer like and uh, how they were grazing in those arid areas and where there's very slight uh, less vegetation then from the distance they saw these groups of uh, wild uh, you know, animals coming, these asses or the kyang, right? And how they just all running together in these uh, courses and raising uh, lots of uh, dust into the air. Then as they leave that behind, they move towards the nomads, you know, tents and uh, at a distance and uh, how with the changing season or with the requirements, the nomads, they keep on shifting their residence, right? That is what uh, they do. And how outside the tents, who was, what was there? There was a dog, the Tibetan Mastiff, very ferocious and uh, right as they approached towards them, how they would chase the vehicle. 
Okay, so this is what we had uh, read yesterday for those who did not join uh, yesterday. So we'll just uh, quickly revise what we have. Drogba, so there's some lo local words have also been used. So Drogba, the shepherds, Kyang, the wild, you know, asses over there. Then Kora, Kora is the Parikrama of Mount Kailash. And as we just saw in the video, that how difficult it is. It's all like what, 55 kilometers or 52 kilometers. And it takes uh, three days to complete it. So quite a difficult uh, task to do, isn't it? Right, so let's move on. We'll continue with the reading. These shaggy monsters, blacker than the darkest night, usually wore bright red collars and barked furiously with massive jaws. Who were these shaggy monsters? The dogs, the Tibetan masters. They were blacker than the darkest night, usually wore bright red collars, and they barked with massive jaws. They were completely fearless of our vehicle. They're not scared of the vehicle. They're just charging towards it, shooting straight into our path, causing Seton to brake and swerve. So all of a sudden, he had to apply the brakes and, uh, yes, you know, like uh, take the control. The dog would make chase for 100 meters or so before easing off, having seen us off the property. They're very territorial. They're very protective about the area, about the property. And so when uh, they would see a vehicle approaching, they would just chase it as if they have sent that vehicle out of their property, right? It wasn't difficult to understand why ferocious Tibetan mastiffs became popular in Chinese imperial courts as hunting dogs, brought along the Silk Road in ancient times as a tribute from Tibet. So yes, it's no wonder these dogs are so ferocious. They run so fast. They, they were used as hunting dogs. So the Chinese emperors, they kept these dogs, uh, right? They would accompany them on their hunting trips. And we have, yes, so many dogs which are there. They're not uh, indigenous from our country. There are many dogs that we have which have come from other places. So you talk about the Pomerian and Apsos with the long hair, isn't it? So, so many dogs we have which are not uh, local. By now, we could see snow-capped mountains gathering on the horizon. We entered a valley where the river was wide and mostly clogged with ice. So it's common sight that as you enter the valleys also, there'll be a river and it looks so beautiful. So it was clogged with ice. So it's uh, melting, right? Brilliant white and glinting in the sunshine. The trail hugged its bank, twisting with the meanders as we gradually gained height and the valley sides closed in. So the trail, which trail, the path which they were, hugged its bank, the banks of the river. So the path, the trail, that the road which they were traveling on, it was going along the bank of the river. The turns became sharper and the ride bumpier. Sharper, all of a sudden, lots of turns over there. And the ride bumpier because it was not a very properly made road. Seaton, now in third gear as we continue to climb. The track moved away from the icy river, laboring through steeper slopes that sported big rocks daubed with patches of bright orange lichen. Beneath the rocks, hunks of snow clung on in the near permanent shade. So yes, so some of the patches of the snow, they were melting, the blocks of ice in the river coming. But under places where it was very shady, the sun did not reach, there were still chunks of snow. And what was there? This growth on the rocks was there. So lichen it was there. I felt the pressure building up in my ears, held my nose, snorted and cleared them. So as we go higher and higher, you go to mountain areas and hilly areas. So what is a common problem that we face? One is breathlessness. That is if when you're walking, but in the vehicle itself, you feel as if you can't hear properly. There's a sound in your ear, isn't it? Right? So that pressure, it builds up in our ear. So we are uh, there immediately, like you hold your nose and kind of breathe out and it will become normal. And some people say you keep uh, chewing gum or something in your mouth. You keep on chewing that also, even then your ears will not uh, close. Right? So he felt that pressure and uh, yes, yeah, so he cleared his ears. We struggled another around another tight bend and Seaton stopped. 
he had opened his door and jumped out of his seat before I realized what was going on. Snow, said Daniel, as he too exited the vehicle, letting in a breath of cold air as he did so. So they stopped all of a sudden. Why? Because in the middle of their track, in the middle of their path, what was there? Snow. And you know, like it is quite difficult to drive over it. You know, when the snow is there on the roads, it is very risky. And especially like of so fresh snow, it might not have settled down so much. But after a day or so, what happens? It becomes slippery, isn't it? Right. So when it starts melting, it becomes a little dangerous. So both Daniel and Seton, they have got out of the vehicle and they are inspecting. What did they notice? Snow. A swath of the white stuff lay across the track in front of us. So like a big ribbon, you know, I say like stretch, it was there across the road so that snow was there for maybe 15 meters before it petered out and the dirt trail reappeared. So almost 15 meters that snow was there. After that, the dirt trail was there. The snow continued on either side of us, smoothing the abrupt bank on the upslope side. The bank was too steep for our vehicle to scale, so there was no way around the snow patch. Right? So there was snow on either side of us and on the bank also. So where are they going to go? Otherwise, they could have maneuvered the vehicle. They could have moved it a little way and gone. Right? The bank was too steep for our vehicle to scale, so they can't go on the bank. There was no way around the snow patch. So they had to drive through it, which is a little risky. I joined Daniel as Seaton stepped onto the encrusted snow and began to slither and slide forward, stamping his foot from time to time to ascertain how sturdy it was. I looked at my wristwatch. We were 5,210 meters above sea level. So quite an altitude and a big height they were. And uh, so he has also joined them, trying to see what can they do. No, they will have to drive through the snow, which is a little difficult because on the side of the bank, there's lots of snow. They can't go over there because the bank slope is a little steep. The snow didn't look deep to me. But the danger wasn't its depth. So it's not how deep it is. What is the danger? Daniel said, so much as its icy top layer. The top layer has frozen. It's become very icy. And that is what the problem is. If we slip off, the car could turn over. On the side, there is the steep bank. Although they're in a valley right now, but the banks of the river, they are quite steep, right, nearby. He suggested, as we saw Seaton grab handfuls of dirt and fling them across this frozen surface. So Seaton, yes, yeah, so he's a local person. He knows what the problems are. So he's taken some dirt and he's throwing it on the snow, maybe to make the drive easier. Yes, we both pitched in. And when the snow was spread with soil, see, they've covered the snow with soil. So there are no chances of slipping. Daniel and I stayed out of the vehicle to lighten Seaton's road. So Seaton there, he's a local person, he's a driver also, and he's taking the car and the other two have come out, so it becomes lighter. He backed up and drove towards the dirty snow, eased the car and slowly drove its length without apparent difficulty. So these are things, you know, we do notice and you might have experienced also if you've gone there with a place where there's snow and driving through it. So as a, a good driver will always be very, very cautious, right? That is the sign of a good driver. And if you're trying to be too adventurous, you are there putting a risk to yourself and to others. So Seaton, very rightly, what did he do? He put that dirt on the snow and then he drove through it. So there's no risk of slipping or skidding and falling or an accident happening. And then the others, they followed. 10 minutes later, we stopped at another blockage. Not good, sir, Seaton announced as he jumped out again to survey the scene. This time he decided to try and drive around the snow. 
So there was another, you know, like what, a blockage. There was more snow on the road, but this time Seaton said, no, it doesn't look good. But he's tried to drive around it. So he's gone a little further distance and then coming back on the road again. Seaton announced as he jumped out again to survey the scene, this time he decided to try and drive around the snow. The slope was steep and studded with major rocks, but somehow Seaton negotiated them. There were rocks and imagine driving through the rocks. His four wheel drive vehicle lurching from one obstacle to the next. Yes, can you tell me what's a four wheel drive? In so doing, he cut off one of the hairpin bends, regaining the trail further up where the snow had not drifted. So yes, so he, he, his uh, four-wheel drive, uh, I think it's something to do with the vehicles there, is it? Right, about how many wheels are there in motion or whatever, he's able to uh, use all of them, is it? Obviously, all the wheels will move, but I think so there is more something specific. Yes, anybody ready to shed some light? How, how is the four-wheel drive helpful in the hilly areas? Yes, anyone? Boys, girls, can you tell me? So he's able to navigate, yes, so it is, maybe it gives an advantage than the other kind of uh, vehicles that are there. So these uh, vehicles, they have an advantage in the hilly area, so they're able to overcome the, you know, rough uh, terrain. So what did Seaton do? He went around the snow, he went a little higher up, and in the process, they were able to miss one of the bends also, right? So bends, they say, you types, you know, you like, you go there and like this and like that. So all these meandering paths that you have on the mountain. So we, we do come across so many, these hairpin bends, you know, when you go to Rohatang Pass. So how many of you have experienced it? Can I get a yes or no? Can I see if you are awake or asleep? Yes. Have you experienced it? Anybody going to tell me about four-wheel drive? Who's going to tell me about four-wheel drive? Yes, Harshika. Yeah. So it is there, you know, and you feel like, oh, God, you, as if you're moving along with the vehicle and you start feeling so giddy also. Isn't it? Right? Yes. So who's going to tell me about it? Yes. Uh, let me see. Yes, as all the four wheel. Thank you, girl. Very good answer. Obviously, I was waiting for this. So as two wheels of the car, they can't push the vehicle in the hilly areas. So four wheel vehicle, which has more power as all the wheels, they move together, right? Natural. So you need a lot of strength here. You're climbing upwards. You are navigating. Yes, which will easily move it. Yeah, give it more strength. Very good. Very nice answer. Yes, so this is what I was waiting for. So naturally it is an advantage there in the hilly area. I checked my watch again as we continue to climb in the bright sunshine. See it's snowing, but it is there this ice and snow around, but yes, the sun does shine brightly and it makes uh, that uh, snow reflect and all, right? And it's still quite chilly. We crept past 5,400 meters and my head began to throb horribly. I took gulps from my water bottle, which is supposed to help a rapid ascent. So there's so many theories we have, okay? Like as you climb higher and higher, some people, they start getting that mountain sickness. What are the things you need to do so that you remain, uh, what you, you don't um, have that motion sickness, isn't it? Right, so yes, yeah, so drink water as you rise, go higher and higher. So this is what the narrator has done. He took a few sips of water. We finally reached the top of the pass at 5515, 5,515 meters, the pass they have reached. It was marked by a large cairn of rocks festooned with white silk scars and ragged prayer flags. So, right, so we, uh, he's reached the top of the pass and uh, now when they reach there, there's this pile of rocks. They are decorated with scarves and prayer flags. It's just like you saw in the video, so many flags over there and it is the pilgrims who have come, right? So in Buddhists also, yes, yeah, so they keep those flags. We took a, we all took a turn around the cairn in a clockwise direction, as is the tradition. 
and Seton checked the tires on his vehicle. So all the people who went there, it was a ritual, it was a tradition. They stopped over there and clockwise they went around the pile of rocks, right? Or so like, yes, so. He stopped at the petrol tank and partially unscrewed the top, which emitted a loud hiss. So he opened the lid and there was a hiss sound. The lower atmospheric pressure was allowing the fuel to expand. So what happens when the pressure is low? What is going to happen to the volume? It was expanding, isn't it? It sounded dangerous to me, maybe, sir. Seaton laughed, but no smoking. So don't smoke now. I've opened the petrol tank. And uh, yes, uh, the atmospheric pressure is low. That is why we have to figure in breathing also. My headache soon cleared as we careered down. So now they're coming down the other side of the path. So they've, they've reached the peak, the highest point, And now they're coming down because from one place to another, right? From the mountain ranges and all. And so as they're coming down, yeah, we get a sigh of relief. Oh God, we reached the peak. Now we're coming down. The other side, it was two o'clock by the time we stopped for lunch. We ate hot noodles inside a long canvas tent, part of a work camp erected beside a dried salt lake. So they stopped for their lunch and they had some noodles and they're beside a dry salt lake. We stop here for the day and we'll continue on Monday.